and uh, he jumped out of the bed, and he, already, and he found that the water was already ankle deep in his apartment. So he decided to call his landlord, and his landlord told him to go quickly rent a water vacuum and get the water up so it didn't ruin his property. So the young man rushed out to his car and found that it had a flat tire. He decided he better get some real help, so he went back into, up to his apartment and sloshed to the water, picked up the phone to make the phone call, and it shocked him so badly that he ripped it off the wall. By this time, he knew he really needed some help. And so he decided to go back down to his car, but when he tried to get out the door, the door would not bulge. That's because the water had made the door swell in its frame. And so he had to scream from inside his apartment until somebody came and kicked the door uh, from the outside in inside. And he rushed out to go down to his car and found that somebody had stolen his car flat tire and all. While everything else was going on, somebody had stolen his car. Even though he had a flat tire, that meant they must have fixed it, stole it. He knew he had no gas in his car, so he ran down the street for a couple blocks, and there it was right in the middle of the road. He got some people to help him push his car back to his apartment, and finally he got the water turned off, the car fixed, the flat tire fixed, and gas in his car. By that time, he knew he was really going to have to hustle to make it to his ROTC graduation ceremony. Grabbing his bayonet out of the trunk, he put it, flipped it into his car, ran upstairs to dress. When he came back down to his car, he forgot that his bayonet was in the front seat, the driver's seat, and yes, he sat down on it. Then he found himself on the way to the emergency room where he had, shall we say, strategic surgery. Trudging back to his apartment when he got back, he opened the door and found that the falling plaster had fell onto his bird cage of his canary, pet canary, and toppled the cage and the bird was dead. And as he dashed over to where the cage lay, he slipped on the wet carpet and injured his back. Once more he found himself in the emergency room. By that time his story, as they say, had gone viral in the little community in which he lived. And so a reporter caught up to him, and the journalist asked him, how can you explain a day like this? And the young man said, well, I guess God was trying to kill me, but he just kept missing. I don't know. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had a day like that? Most of us probably have. Well, there's a man by the name of Job in the Bible, who certainly had reason to feel that way. Changing gears this morning, which I was going to do last Sunday, changing gears this morning, where our focus uh, at the start of the year was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, we're going to spend a few weeks, maybe four or five sermons, focusing on Job's story just to get the gist and hopefully learn some lessons. So if you'll take your Bible with me and turn to Job, the very first chapter, let's find out what's going on. You may or may not be familiar with this story, and uh, I'm going to skip some verses and uh, paraphrase some others so you'll figure out what's going on as we read it together. Begin reading with the first verse in Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, by the way, recognize that place? That's where Abraham came from, by the way. And anyway, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Mark that in your Bible. And seven sons, and three daughters, born to him. His possessions also, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man, was the greatest of all the men of the East. Now, skip on down to verse 6. And here's where I'm going to begin paraphrasing. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came upon them. And the Lord said to Satan, 
Where have you been? Now, by the way, this is a rhetorical question. God knows what Satan's been up to. It's also a trick question, because he also knows what Satan wants to do. And so Satan tells him uh, in verse 8, in verse 7. And verse 8 says, Satan, and The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God, turning away from, and, and turning away from evil. Notice how Satan answered God in verses 9 and following. Basically what Satan said was, Well, sure, he's upright, and he follows you and he worships you. Why not? You put a hedge around him. You protect him. You've made him wealthy. You've given him everything that he has. Why not should he bless you in the way he has? You've given him so much. But, verse 11, put forth thy hand now, touch all he has, take it all away, and he will surely curse you. I bet you, I bet you, I bet you, Satan's saying. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now it happened on that on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house that a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans have formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, mind you, God released Satan to do all this. God didn't do this. Right, keep that in mind. Verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. We're told in the first five verses that Job was blameless, rich, and righteous, a rare, rare combination. We must understand that blameless is not the same word as guiltless. If a person is guiltless, it means that he or she has done nothing wrong. If someone is uh, uh, blameless, it meant that no matter how horrible their offenses might be, all charges against them were dropped. Absolutely no blame was attached to them because the very one he or she has offended has exonerated him. That is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. In the words of the 32nd Psalm, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him. Job was such a man. God had already exonerated him. God had already declared him blameless. He was also an extremely wealthy, powerful man. Yet, clues that are given to us later in this book, we're to understand that Job was no Ebenezer Scrooge with all of his wealth and power. He used his money to benefit people. He used his power to help the weak. He was a righteous man. He was a man of worship and intercession, as we're told in verses 4 and 5. Yet, in spite of all of these evidences of what a good and godly man Job was, his world shattered into pieces. His life came apart at the seams. The calamities came quickly and suddenly, and isn't that the way it usually happens? Trouble seems to come, and when it comes, it seems, to, it seems like it rains and it pours. If you haven't experienced this phenomenon, I hope you never will, you very well might. 
However, Job suffered more than any of us ever will. Why? Why did a blameless, upright, genuine worshiper of God have so much bad stuff to happen to him? Everything near and dear was snatched from him. In chapter 2, we're told at the very beginning, even his health was devastated, which means that Satan cheated in this little contest because God told Satan, do not lay a finger on the man. And in fact, everything was taken from Job except the one thing he probably could have done without, a nagging wife. Do you know what Mrs. Job said to him over in chapter 2 as he was sitting in the ashes of his life? Basically what she said, you can read it for yourself, she said, I, honey, I see that life has been a little hard on you, so why don't you just get it over with? Curse God and die. Nice lady. Understanding, sensitive, kind, wasn't she? She might say, we might say that she was an outspoken woman. Which reminds me of a man who once asked, Does your wife, Was your wife outspoken? To which he replied, Not by anyone I know of. But, let's return to our question of why. By the way, this has become extremely relevant given the events that took place in Boston this past week. Most Americans today woke up still asking many questions. Why? What? Why? All these questions. And as I see it, we have three answers, uh, and none of, the, of them will satisfy all of us completely. By the way, are y'all cold? How many of y'all are cold? Okay, turn this fan off. It's selling old. Uh, on, on, on. Jerry Don, would you turn, uh, or Ben, turn it from the fan from on to auto. And maybe you'll, I'm not sure why I did that. I'm just, maybe my fever ran up, I don't know. Just turn it off. Okay, that's better. Now you'll warm up. Okay. Anyway, the first two options that we have are both poor and inadequate choices, but there are people who hold to one or the other, at least to some degree or the other, including a great many people in Christian churches. And the first one goes something like this. Listen carefully. It goes something like this. Bad things happen to good people because God is good, but sometimes He's just a little short on power. Almost 20 years ago now, a Jewish rabbi um, from Notick, Massachusetts, published a book which became an immediate runaway bestseller. He wrote it out of his own life experience. He and his wife had a son that they named Aaron. And from the very beginning, as an infant, he was a bright and happy child. The parents, however, were more than a little concerned with his health. Aaron stopped gaining weight at eight months, and after his first birthday, his hair began to fall out. The doctors assured the worried parents that he would grow, but that he would be very short. By the age of three, they took Aaron to a local pediatrician who studied him for two months, and he came back with the diagnosis that Aaron had a very rare condition called progeria, which means rapid aging. The rabbi and his wife were told that their little boy would never grow past three feet in height, and that he would have no hair on his head or anywhere on his body, that even as a child, he would look like a little old man and would probably die in his teens of literally old age. As the short years of his life flew by, anywhere Aaron went, people pointed at him and stared at him. He was to never have a normal life, and at the age of 14, Aaron died. And Rabbi Harold Kushner, Kushner wrote a book entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. The rabbi decided, he believed, that a good God would not allow such a thing to happen. 
And since a rabbi wanted desperately to believe that God is always good, his only logical conclusion was that God was powerless to do anything at times. His God was not the all-powerful creator and miracle worker of the Bible, but a God who is infinitely good and benevolent, if a bit short on power. Now, Rabbi Kushner's theology wasn't anything new. This has been around for a long time. The book became a bestseller not because he came up with a bold, new, original answer to what is literally the world's oldest question, why, but because it gave people a God that they could feel good about. But then I ask you, is a God stripped of power really God? The answer, of course, is no. I might sentimentally and love God, a good and benevolent God, but I could never trust Him because I can't count on Him if He's going to be powerless at times. I need a God that I can count on all the time, not just some of the time, and Kushner's God, I could not count on. Besides, the world in which we seems the world in which we live today seems to be slipping out of control. The awful events that took place this past week in Boston, beginning with the bombings at the at the uh, marathon, is one more thing in a long list of things. If we just go back to Christmas of 2011 with the school shootings that took place in Newton and all of the shootings, and there have been many of them just over the last year or so, just in this country, not to mention the rest of the world, including the terrible explosion and the fire that killed at least 15 people in Texas during the same period. All of this tells us that the world sometimes appears to us to be spinning out of control. My only hope is in a sovereign God who is going to bring all the bad and ugly and negative things in such a world to a successful conclusion one day. If there is a God, if God is not all-powerful and in control, then we have some really serious problems, and I have a lot more questions than merely why. The story pictured for us in Job is a God who is in charge and all-powerful. Job himself did not consider God lacking in the power department. What Satan, and underscore that, what Satan does to God, I mean does to Job, God allows. God never abdicates his throne, he never, uh, or his position, but the fact that God allowed Satan to ruin Job's life makes the question of why even more pronounced. And so there are some folks who have concluded that yes, God is all-powerful. Here's the second one now. But He's not always good. Somehow, what happened to Job just doesn't seem fair, does it? But most of us have already learned Life isn't always fair for any of us, is it? None of us is exempt, but then whose fault is it? For a good number of people, God takes the rap for life not being fair and for bad things happening to good people. Let me give you an example. Uh, David Blumenthal is a Jewish rabbi. No, I'm not picking on Jewish rabbis this morning. It may appear that way, but I'm not. Uh, who's also a religion professor at Emory University in Atlanta. He wrote a book that was published a few years ago with the title, and I kid you not, Facing the Abusing God. That was the title of his book. He was asked in an interview in his book, what kind of God would allow the systematic destruction of six million Jews in the Holocaust? Blumenthal argues in his book, that it is theologically appropriate not only to regard God as just and loving, 
but also as abusive. His idea is that God is like any other sick and out of control parent who sometimes abuses his children. When asked what it was about God that allowed for a break in the covenant relationship with his people, Israel, Blumenthal answered that if we are created in the image of God and we have a dark side, and I quote now, it is in a certain sense God has a dark side as well. Well, here you have it, friends. A Star Wars God. Let the force be with you. Now, if you're not shocked by now, I have one more intellectual gem to give you from Rabbi Blumenthal. Since God is at times abusive, then for us to be reconciled, the rabbi suggests, and I quote again, that if we can repent to God, then God can repent to us. No kidding. When he was asked how could God show repentance to, uh, for the Holocaust, Blumenthal replied, I don't know. That's kind of up to God to make the Jews, the Jewish people, an offer. Now, there are a lot of people who think along these lines. By the way, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to go ahead. I haven't been here for two weeks. If I go over two minutes, you'll be okay, okay? Uh, when we were living in that other college town north of here that we do not mention around here, um, a terrible tragedy took place toward the end of my ministry at the church I was pastoring there. Uh, the Chi Omega uh, sorority was having a walk a thong, and for whatever reason, they were walking on the wrong side of the road. And uh, a pickup truck uh, pulling a hay baler came over the rise, and some of those girls were actually in, out on the road and not completely over uh, in the grass or anywhere else. And he came over this little rise. And he just plowed right through them. I think five were killed. I know one girl had to have her leg amputated. Uh, I was called to the hospital because I was on a uh, long story. But anyway, I was called to the hospital. Unfortunately, on two occasions, I was asked by parents when their children got to the place where they were stabilized to go into the room and tell their children their friends had been killed. Not a good assignment. But that night at the Chi Omega sorority house, all the questions of why, there was a, not a Catholic priest, but there was a priest from an unnamed denomination I'm going to give you right now, who came to the house and asked the question of why his answer was, well, this is just one of God's Mistakes. It was not a healing answer for anyone. And then I had to deal with all that. But there are a lot of people who think along these lines. That God is not always good. Or at the very least, that he has a nasty streak that he displays now and then. Interestingly, Job never concluded that, God, that any of his troubles had anything to do with a question of God's goodness. All the way through the book, you'll find this to be true. He never considered the idea that God is all-powerful, but not always good, because it never crossed his mind. In fact, Job's response to all the bad stuff that happened to him, what was it? We read it a few moments ago. Look at it again in verse 20. What was Job's response? Notice, he Worshipped. That was his response. He worshipped. And so the answer to our questions and to Job's calamities must lie somewhere else. Frankly, I could never love a God who was not always good. And since Jesus summed up the law this way, that the first and greatest commandment is this one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the God that I know and have met personally in Jesus Christ is a God who is always good and all-powerful. And in the remaining moments we have together, 
Let's talk about that. Okay? Job saw this truth for himself, which explains his response of worship. Not blame, not finger pointing, but of worship. But how does this explain the question, why? The stark reality is there is no simple explanation. Doesn't mean I'm gonna give you not gonna give you one. But we Americans love fast and easy answers. The devil has sold as many and cheap answers as McDonald's has sold hamburgers. Easy answers are not always possible whenever the questions are not so simple. However, there are clues as to what the answer might be. And I call these clues glimpses of the truth. And the first one goes something like this. The real struggle is not what we think it is. I prefer to say, go back to the duel. I mean, go back to the conversation between God and Satan. Go back to that. I think it starts with verse 6. I prefer to see God's and Satan's contest or conversation as a duel. The real struggle here is not between Job and his God. The real struggle here is between God and Satan. The battle is celestial in scope and it is spiritual in nature. But I think it's more a duel than it is a war. In war as in love, all's fair and anything goes, or so we're told. But now a duel was a highly formal, almost civilized contest between two opposing parties in which there were rules that had to be followed. There were no unfair advantages given to one contestant over the other. For this reason, the duelist chose identical weapons and followed a very strict code of conduct. What was on the line in a duel was not strength or skill or marksmanship, but honor. Honor. In this duel between God and Satan, God legitimately could have simply paraded. In fact, that's what the devil had already it, it, the devil already accused him for, Job being so upright and righteous. He could have paraded his superior strength and unlimited power by unleashing his big cannons against Satan's puny pea shooters. But in terms of honor, does such a victory really? prove anything? No, because even the devil already acknowledges, the Bible tells us this, the devil already acknowledges God's unquestioned power. So then, on what common territory can these two adversaries meet? What common weapons can they employ? The answer, as uncomfortable as it might be for us, is that human beings, body and soul, are the dueling ground where heavenly powers clash. The scriptures tell this to us in numerous places, by the way. We're told this. Scripture tells us this. God's moral supremacy over the devil is the point to be proved. And folks, the hearts of those created in the image of God are the high stakes for which this duel is fought. So bad things happen to good people because Satan dares question God's right to rule over the hearts of men and women. While we struggle on earth, God is constantly battling with Satan in the world of the Spirit. Or in this battle, it's fought on two fronts, not just the one that we can see with our eyes. Yet the Bible tells us that one day, with the coming of the Lord, that this duel will end decidedly. In God's absolute favor, and Satan will no longer be able to be allowed to harm or harass us. For those of us on earth, the greatest question is this one. Who will win humanity's allegiance and praise? God or Satan? Better yet, when crunch time comes, to whom will a person trust his or her life? Now some folks think that there is a middle option. Not God, not Satan. I'm going to trust my life to me. 
Satan's lie. He wants you to believe that you can trust your life to yourself without God, and he's already got you in his pocket. The duel here, though, is eminently a fair one. No one, including Satan, can accuse God of rigging the duel in his favor, and in fact, if there is an advantage, it is Satan's, in that the fact that the duel ends up being fought not in the full light of day, but in confusion and darkness, which is obviously Satan's home turf. But perhaps there's a second clue that will also help us. The simple fact is, now listen closely, sin is in the world. And wherever sin is, bad things happen to everybody. The ravages of sin are non-discriminatory. The innocent suffer along with the guilty. Now, if we watch those images of those true brothers in Boston, before the explosion ever took place, didn't, and we saw those images before we knew anything was going on, we would have seen two young men roaming around among these bystanders and spectators while the marathon was being run, and we would have had no clue of the mayhem and the anger and the murder that was in their hearts. They looked perfectly innocent. Yeah, a little suspicious, but that's in hindsight. And bad things happen to good people. And bad people lie. Now one is dead. The other is seriously wounded. Now Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount this would be true. He said that the sun shines on the evil and the good. And that it rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Even Jesus did not escape pain and suffering. And He was perfectly good. He came into our world, a world filled with sin, and shared our suffering and our pain. If bad things can happen to Jesus, then surely none of us will be exempt. But still, I ask the question, why? I've come to understand a third truth, or I should say a glimpse of truth. God's Actions or seemingly inactions will always be a mystery to me. The ways of God are often shrouded in mystery because the ways of God are far above our total comprehension. They are. I may not always know why, but I am confident that He knows. Why? There are many times that I've asked the question, why? And then years later, it's like a light bulb comes on and I th say to myself, now I understand, now I see, I get it. And there are times that I've asked why, and I may never receive an answer on this side of heaven. Still, we the human beings want to know the cause and effect of every little thing that happens. And so, when we can't get answers, then we come up with all kinds of seriously flawed and erroneous conclusions like either God is not all-powerful or He's not always good. There are other conclusions that people draw as well. What arrogance. Even if God gave us an answer to everything that happens, every time it happens, could we finite, limited creatures who only use a, a tenth of our own brain power, and that's being charitable to some, could we really comprehend? Could we? Suppose the answer to why is worse than not knowing. The poet T.S. Eliot, Eliot once said, humankind cannot bear very much reality. Words of wisdom. The question of why is fundamentally a faith issue anyway. People of faith don't always need an answer to why. Now, 
doesn't mean that we cannot legitimately ask the question. I ask it all the time. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't raise the question, discuss the question, but we don't always need an answer to why. Remember what the Scriptures teach us. Listen closely. The righteous shall live by faith, not by sight, not by getting an answer to every little thing that happens. It's enough to know that God knows why and to trust Him. Besides, there will always be mystery associated with the ways of God because He is God and we are not anything close. This is why Job's initial and immediate response was one of worship. Whatever the reason, Job trusted God with it. In fact, over in the 13th chapter, Job will say some of the finest words in all the Bible. Though he slay me, kill me, still I will trust in him. And that's a trust, folks, that comes only in relationship with God. And for Job, it was enough. Now, didn't know how I'd feel at the end of this sermon, but I'm going to do something tonight. I'm not trying to get a crowd, but I'm going to do something tonight. Given the events that played out last week and everything that happened before that, we all have still questions about why. So here's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to address a little bit more of this, not from Job, from other places in Scripture, the question of why. Why do bad things happen? Where is God? Subsidiary questions like, is man inherently good or evil? And it's going to be totally an off-the-cuff sermon. You may not agree with me. And, uh, you know, I wish I was that good to have the perfect answer, but volumes have been written about this, and still I ask why. But I'm going to take a stab at it. And if you want to dig a little deeper, go a little deeper with me, and try to find some answers about some of these questions rolling in our minds that many Americans have. You'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock. Totally off the cuff. We'll quit on time. But I feel God leading me to do this. Most of you know that I've been very, very, very sick. Now, here's what's interesting. I was going to start this series of sermons on Job last Sunday before the events that took place in Boston, which would have made last Sunday's sermon really rhetorical. God has a great sense of timing. Now, no, God didn't make me sick so I could start today. But God did use my sickness to bring this sermon and tonight's to a very relevant time. That's all God. And he's the one who's healing me, by the way. I want you to know that. Let's pray together. Father, we still have questions. We're not fully satisfied. Some of us may never be. I'm one of those. But then at the same time, because of faith, I trust that one day I will be. Because I know you. I trust you. I believe that you are an all-powerful and always good God. Oh, there are times questions are raised. I think fingers get pointed in the wrong direction. For one thing, we kind of skip over the human actors in all these dramas. That's something we need to talk about tonight. And I pray, Father, that you will help us to understand at a level that we can understand, but it's always going to take a certain measure of faith for us to get there and wrap our minds and our hearts around these issues, these questions. So may faith, along with reason, be the guiding principle, but faith is going to always have to come out on top. Because your ways are far beyond our comprehension. And there are times, like Job, we just have to trust you and worship you. 
Thank you for being God that you are, that you have presented and re revealed to us in Jesus Christ. For when we look at him, we see you. And that's the kind of God in whom I'm willing to put my hands and have. In his name, amen.